Good morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thanks we can gather around your word as brothers uh, to encourage uh, each other, I suppose, as we speak um, truths, as we respond uh, in praise. Uh, but most of all, as we hear your word, we pray that our hearts would respond rightly, uh, even now as we hear uh, reflections on this part of scripture we've had just read for us. We ask for your blessing in that, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask the question this morning, uh, how prepared uh, for the reality of Christian ministry are you? I mean, you're here at Moore College, you're training for Christian ministry, uh, but how prepared are you for Christian ministry? Um, the other night I was talking to a minister and, uh, recently, and, and he, uh, not long after sharing with me about how well things were going uh, in the parish, uh, he said to me the other night, uh, but Mark, all hell is about to break loose. There was a serious issue that was just, you know, landed on his, his plate. And I think it's true, sometimes uh, ministry can feel like we are uh, walking on sunshine, things are going really, really well, and, uh, and are going great, we're on top of the world. And then at other times, quick as a flash, it feels like it's all going downhill. Uh, in fact, sometimes it can feel like you're really just about to confront uh, uh, so much opposition, sort of like a D-Day landing kind of thing. There goes the, the ship, sort of the, the, uh, the ramp goes down and the onslaught begins. And it can be quite quick between those two things and transition and through ministry can kind of go up and down and sometimes be uh, in between. That's the, that's the reality of ministry. We can feel like sometimes we're kicking goals for Jesus and then quickly on the other times it feels like we're being kicked around the ballpark by Satan. So we need to be, generally speaking, not ministry optimists, nor ministry pessimists, but ministry realists. And that's what the Apostle Paul is, uh, in this whole letter, really trying to communicate to his student, Timothy. Um, uh, you know, um, yesterday I put the whole letter, I sort of typed, well I didn't type it, I copied it, and I just got rid of the, the numbers of the verses and chapters and so forth and headings, and I plonked it into one of those word-generating things. You know what they're called? Word clouds, online. Just copy, paste, boom, what comes up? Well, if you kind of get rid of words like Lord, God, Christ, Jesus, which sounds almost blasphemous, but if you do that, you know, including it and the and an and so forth, some of the major words that appear repeatedly are things like endure, endure hardship, persecution, ashamed, those kinds of words. And on the other hand, gospel, word, sound, truth, faith, grace. They're the kind of big ones that come up. And that picture doesn't really convey blissful optimism totally, nor does it convey hopeless pessimism totally. Rather, it conveys something of the reality of Christian ministry. That's what Paul's trying to convey to us this morning. And he wants us to be prepared for Christian ministry by knowing something about the reality of Christian ministry. What do I mean? Firstly, he says, uh, in contrast to the preceding verses, know this or mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Not it's possible that there'll be terrible times or there might be terrible times, but there will be terrible times in these last days. Kind of like a Revelation-esque reality. We've been reading through Revelation. That's the sort of realities of these last times. Having just emphasised the possible repentance of Timothy's ministry opposition, here in this passage he gives a fuller description of the serious difficulties between Christ's first and second advent. What's going to make it so difficult? Well, people is the answer. Not just people, but sinful people. And the way he strings together these 19 characteristics where he goes on, it's not like he's saying, you know, one or two people will have all of them. It's far more like a big wanted poster where all of those characteristics are listed. It's a, this list characterises the, the range of people problems in this age. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, unself-controlled, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, lover the lovers of God. Rather than lovers of God. You'll be glad to know that I, I, I'm not, I, I am going to sorry, echo uh, John Calvin's comment on the, that, that verse. He says that the words don't need explanation. 
still. It's worth saying that they are, there's something quite interesting, they are very similar, in fact, to Paul's list of vices in Romans 1. Both that passage and this one make the point that they've exchanged the love of God the Creator for the love of things within creation. But where the passages are different is that this one situates them squarely in the Christian community. Verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying its power. That is, these people here are professing to be Christians without knowing the reality of Christ. They're mingled among the godly but are themselves godless. They pretend to be interested in the power of the gospel but prefer the power of their own pleasures. During um, some of my uh, doctoral research, I, I came across some manuscript notes from one of the English reformers that makes a similar point uh, in a different context. He writes, You should be ministry, but you, you are magistry. For pastors, you're impostors. For servi servorum, you'll be domini dominorum. For minimi, you'll be maximi, pardon Latin. For episcopi, you will be monarchy. For Christiani, you'll be anti Christianissimi, which basically is the most anti Christian. So he's, he's getting into this pastors. Now, you're impostors, kind of talk. Now, we don't live in the first century, we don't live in the 16th century, but we still live in the same terrible times. I led a, a little uh, Bible study uh, for the, the GAFCON Australia uh, Conference Committee last week. Uh, I reflected on these passages here, last week's one and then this one's. Let's just say there's a reasonable degree of application to be made. Uh, you might not have encountered a whole lot of this in your ministry thus far, uh, but we, we don't even know how much of it uh, Timothy faced in his ministry thus far. But Paul knows that Timothy, and by extension us too, uh, will, he uses that word, will face this sort of thing in future. And so his advice, in fact his command, is to have nothing to do with such people or avoid them. Now, one subset of this group he goes on to describe as a bunch of worms. I wonder what Paul would think of the Aussie put down, your maggots. You know? And that's the sort of thing that he's, he's, he's thinking about, this, this, new, this new group he speaks about in verses, same with verse 6. He says, they're the kind that worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. It's akin to kind of victim and abuser language. Some of these power-hungry pleasure seekers use their positions of authority to their own advantage and the expense of others. And it's not unheard of for men in ministry to spiritually abuse vulnerable women in this way. And so I say to a bunch of brothers, beware of the power dynamics in your own ministry. Beware of transference when you're meeting up with people. Be really acutely aware of the kind of power that you'll have in your ministry. I want to say that, so I can't go past this without saying that, but mostly what I want to say is to beware of these godless worms who might infiltrate your churches and poor, burdened parishioners. Now, now, now notice, of course, this is, needs to be said again, um, that Paul doesn't think that all women are like this. Um, that, that's, some people have thought that based on this verse, but Paul doesn't think that all women are like this. <clears throat> there are some weaker and more susceptible women, perhaps through their own sins and desires, perhaps through their own approach to Christian learning. You can imagine a single mum who's been through some really hard knocks having the uh, attention of a smooth-talking spiritualist or an older woman glued to the writings of some questionable televangelist guru. I mean, you could kind of imagine different things. And I want to say something else. It doesn't actually matter whether it's women or men. In fact, either way, whoever it is in your congregation, we need to build up our flocks, protect our flocks, shepherd our flocks. Well, the good news uh, is that this subset of power-hungry, pleasure-hungry imposters will be eventually exposed 
for what they are. In verse 8, Paul gives the example of Yanez and Yambres. Most likely the exposed are Egyptian magicians who resisted God's command through Moses to let my people go. Um, we watched uh, with the kids The Prince of Egypt on the weekend. And, and if you haven't watched it, watch it. It's, it's really good. I actually really enjoyed it. Uh, and, and, and it characterises these two magicians, I think, really well. You know, they kind of think they've got it all together. They're, they're pretty fancy, but they get shown to be total frauds. They've got nothing on the reality of God. And Paul says, just as these guys oppose the truth and were shown to be frauds, so too will the folly of these imposters in Ephesus be shown for what it is. Paul comforts Timothy and us in light of these difficult times that they will not get very far. And so, to be realists in ministry, Paul thus far says, know the godless world and know the godless worms, but now he says, know the godly ways. Know the godly ways. Verse 10, Almost the opposite of the vice list he gives above, Paul says, look, if you want to be godly, look at me. You know, however, uh, you, however, know all about my teaching, uh, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance, my persecutions, my sufferings. What kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium and Lystra? And by the way, it's, it's significant um, that Paul puts those three cities together. I actually think this, the more I think about it, this triumvirate of experiences plays a huge part in Paul's own ministry uh, mindset. Chronologically, Paul was persecuted and chased out of Antioch. Paul uh, faced a plot to persecute him in Iconium, and so he fled to Lystra, where he was stoned and dragged outside the city. Okay, there's a chronology there. What's also interesting is that it was people when he was there in uh, um, Lystra, people from both Iconium and Antioch, who came over to Lystra to gang up on him and persecute him there. And then what's even more interesting is that after Paul recovers, he went back to those three cities. He ministered to the believers in Lystra, Iconium and Antioch. And what's the only sample from those sermons that he preached when he went back in those churches? The only little phrase we've got from us from Acts 17, 22, and it says this, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. That was the guts of it that's recorded for us in Scripture. Undoubtedly, Timothy uh, would have sometime have heard of Paul's death shortly after receiving this letter. Hardship, suffering to the point of death. And although not in Scripture, um, John Fox, the reformer, gives an account of Paul's death in his Book of the Martyrs, Acts and Monuments. He says this, Paul the Apostle, who before was called Saul, after his great travail and unspeakable labours in promoting the Gospel of Christ, suffered also in his first persecution under Nero and was beheaded. And in my church in in Canterbury, the, the great big stained glass window at the east end of the church is Paul's beheading. It looks like the the guy's about to behead him with a lightsaber. It's quite something. Anyway, but Fox goes on. Nero sent two of his esquires, Ferega and Parthamias, to bring him word of his death. And they, coming to Paul, instructed the people, desired him to pray for them that they might believe, who told them that shortly after they should believe and be baptised at his sepulchre. Uh, And this done, the soldiers came, led him out of the city to the place of execution where he, after his prayers made, gave his neck to the sword. Timothy probably would have heard some of that. And you can wonder how Paul's words in this letter might have stayed with Timothy. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. How would those words have, you know, resounded and rung out in Timothy's mind for years and years to come afterwards? If you think about that, I wonder actually how, how Jesus' words would have stayed in Paul's mind. Jesus' words, a servant is no greater than the master. If they persecuted me, then they'll persecute you. And given those words and those words, I wonder how they ring in your mind, how those words stay uh, with you and I, 21st century comfortable city. Uh, I don't think we're all uh, meant to be martyrs, 
But there will be uh, wicked men in these terrible times that uh, uh, will be thorns in our side. We could say much more. The pokes and prods of persecution will come. And we must not think ourselves above it. I mean, can you imagine Christ thinking of himself above it? Through the mocking and the whipping and the crown of thorns, uh, the humiliation, uh, the pain of crucifixion, the horror of divine punishment for innumerable sins of the world. Can you imagine Christ exempting himself from the cross? Praise God, no. We'll sing a song at the end, See Him Jerusalem, and that's a beautiful way of just reflecting on this. And there's an implicit call for us to see ourselves following in that same way that Paul did and that Timothy did and that we are to do too. Calvin writes, uh, In short, let us know that we are Christians on this condition that we shall be liable to many tribulations. That's a good way to put it. The godless avoid the hard road of the Christian life, whereas we know the godly way. Have you read The Pilgrim's Progress? Has anyone here would feel like admitting to not having read it? It should be, you know, Calvin in summer reading and Pilgrim's Progress somewhere there, I think. It's a cracker. You must. If you've got kids, you must read it to them. If you've read it, you might know something about little Christian, who's the pilgrim, who goes on his godly way, his pilgrimage, on his way to the celestial city, heaven. What was he holding all the way there? Who could tell me? Yeah, a, a, back, what did you say? a backpack, yeah? Burden of sin, yeah, that's right, that has to get taken off, yeah. And what else, what else? Scroll, Scroll that's what I was looking for, that's entirely right too. Scroll, absolutely. The scroll. Well, the scriptures are what Paul calls Timothy and ourselves to hold on to as we go along our godly way, our pilgrimage to the celestial city. Paul says, verse 14, continue or remain in what you've learned and have become convinced of because you know those from who you learnt it, presumably Paul or Timothy's mother or grandmother, and how from infancy you've known the holy scriptures. Now, the ministry of parenthood or children's ministry or youth ministry or ministry to all ages and kinds of people, the knowledge of the Holy Scriptures is absolutely paramount. There's a scene in the Pilgrim's Progress where he falls asleep and it rolls down the hill and and, and that's the worst thing that could possibly happen. He has to go back and get it because he knows he can't go on without it. Why are the Scriptures absolutely paramount? Because they are able to make you wise for salvation in Christ Jesus. There's nothing else uh, in all of creation which is sufficient for salvation. There's no pontiff nor preacher. There's no church council nor church course, no source, no strategy under heaven and earth which contains all things necessary for our salvation. And, And that's what Timothy needs to hold on to, like nothing else. And it's not just su- sufficient for salvation, as, as, and that would be enough, that's remarkable, but it's also useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Wow, this is what we could do. I don't know how many sermons, just on that. But why, why is it so valuable? And the answer is ultimately because it's God-breathed, the opneustus. And and, and Archbishop Cranmer called the Bible the most precious jewel, the most holy relic that remained on earth. You can only imagine what the Apostle Paul might have said to describe the treasure of the truth. What you and I uh, have in our our hands uh, right now is, I mean, just think about it, think about what you're holding, the most marvellous means of ministry possible. We've got it. This in these terrible times. That's quite something. Don't forget that. That's an extraordinary something. You know, for all of our excitement about um, visionary strategies or flashy new courses or well-honed ministry philosophies or the latest Tim Keller or Philip Jensen book, there ought to be nothing more precious to your ministry than the good book, the scroll. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates to dividing soul and spirit 
joints and marrow, judging the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. What else can do that? Good luck finding one. We know, as our reformers knew, as Timothy knew, as the Apostle Paul knew, as our Lord Jesus likewise knew, um, that this godly weapon is vital for our godly way and that it's the antidote to the godless worms in this godless world. This godly weapon, vital for our godly way, the antidote to godless worms in this godless world. And though this world with devils filled shall threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word can fell him. And so if we want to be ministry realists, then we need to know that these things are the reality of Christian ministry. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you know our hearts and that nothing can be hidden from you. We thank you that you cleanse our hearts and those, our brothers who've come before us so that we might be approved workmen, not rejected like those false teachers who've departed from the faith. Help us, Heavenly Father, in this um, godless world where there are godless worms to walk the godly way, knowing we have the most marvellous godly weapon and means of ministry at our disposal and what a joy it is to be at a place like Moore College that values that and to be trained and encouraged and equipped to do just that. Would you bless our endeavours that we might give you great glory and build up your church. In Jesus' name, amen.